Because we're doing pH calculations today, please make sure you have a calculator. The keys that you're going to be interested in are log, log, and 10 to the x. Now on my calculator, you have to push the green button in order to do 10 to the x. I have no idea what happens with you all. Okay? So just make sure you get it out, get it warmed up. Back in chapter 7, we talked about water and electronegativity. We said that because oxygen was more electronegative than hydrogen, that the OH bonds in water were going to be polarized. Going to be positive on this end and negative up by the oxygen. This gives us a molecular dipole that looks something like this. This end of the molecule is positive, and this end is negative. We showed that using an electrostatic potential map. Again, blue represents the absence of electrons, red the excess, so this is positive, and this is negative. <laughs> Any questions? Well, <clears throat> we saw that water was capable of <clears throat> stabilizing charges because of the dipole. If we had a negative ion in solution, the water tended to orient itself around the charge with the positive ends pointing in towards the charge. If we had a positive charge, it was just the opposite. The negative ends of the water all pointed in to the positive charge. This allowed the waters to disperse the charge. By dispersing the charge, you stabilize it. That's what makes it possible to dissolve an ionic compound. Well, I contend that if water is capable of interacting with ions, it can also interact with itself. So here's one water. If we bring another water up to it, such that the negative end is pointing towards one of the positive hydrogens, we can form what's called a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond is actually a covalent bond because we're sharing electrons. But unlike a standard covalent bond, it is weak, um, about 1 20th as strong as a real covalent bond. We also have a positive end here, so we could easily bring in another one and form at least two hydrogen bonds here. We have a negative end up top. We could bring in yet a, another one and form another hydrogen bond going this way. Actually, we can form two with the oxygen. When you take a single water molecule, you can place <coughs> waters around it, and you can show easily four potential hydrogen bonds. Now, each of these is small, but when you add lots of them together, they start to really be significant. This is a calculation done on a cluster of water. <clears throat> what I want to point out here is how adjacent oxygens basically consume the hydrogens that they're hydrogen bonded to. Sometimes not a lot, sometimes a whole lot. This gives water a structure. It makes it extremely stable. It's why water has such a high boiling point for being a low molecular weight compound. And again, it's one of the things that gives rise to a miracle 
of how water can support life. If we look at a cluster like this, it's not static, okay? This is dynamic. This cluster and all hydrogen bonds in it rearrange roughly 10 to the ninth times per second. This is an animation showing a cluster of water in very, very slow motion. The little purple lines represent hydrogen bonds. And you'll see that the waters kind of swing between one and another, making and breaking bonds as they go. This is a very dynamic structure. Again, it rearranges once every one billionth of a second. All right. These hydrogen bonds, even though they're weak, also have another very interesting property. If we take two hydrogen bonded waters and one of them somehow just gets a little bump in solution, you know, somebody bumps into it, whatever. This hydrogen that's in this hydrogen bond and actually transfer from one water to another. When we do that, we get a pair of polyatomic ions, the hydronium cation H3O plus and the hydroxide anion OH minus. Now these guys are in this big uh, <clears throat> pot of water, surrounded by lots of waters. This process can go, but it can also reverse because they're close. So here we go back. And again, this can go the other way once again. So bottom line here, whenever you have pure water, absolutely pure water, there will always be hydronium and hydroxide ions in it. This is called the autoprotolysis of water. Not only does this exist, but we know the concentration of hydronium and hydroxide in pure water. It's 10 to the minus 7 mole per liter each. Yeah. So when it differs, is that when like the pH differentials take place? Or is that something else? We will do pH in a moment. But yes. So in pure neutral water, hydronium and hydroxide are both 10 to the minus 7 mole. This is a very, very important concept, something you need to remember. Concentration of hydronium and hydroxide, 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. Any questions? Now when we do this autoprotolysis reaction, we're generating ions. Now we've seen that um, electrostatic potential maps can be used to describe the ions. For hydronium and hydroxide, it looks something like this. Hydronium, big, big blue bottom. Where the oxygen is, it's kind of pale green. Hydroxide, big, big red. I'm going to focus on hydronium. Hydronium is stabilized exceptionally well by water. This is what hydronium looks like if we're looking at it from the top. Again, this is the oxygen. This is the bottom of the molecule with the three hydrogens. Turn it on its side, it's even more striking. Huge blue bottom, light green top. Very positive, very charged. Now we saw in the chapter on solutions that we could take an ion, surround it by water, 
and disperse this charge. <clears throat> Water is even better at stabilizing the charge or hydronium. Let's see. Here's a hydronium. I'm going to surround it by three waters. In orient the negative end towards the hydrogen. And I'm going to calculate my surface. This again is a water, big blue area. When we calculate the net result, we get, instead of green for this oxygen, it's actually turning a bit yellow, isn't it? And we have dispersed the positive charge, so there's little bits on the edges, but not very much. But remember we said that water doesn't travel in groups of three or four. It's more like eight, 10, 12. So let's take our hydronium and surrounded by eight adjacent waters. Now we're going to calculate the electrostatic potential map for the whole thing. Once again, this is the hydronium, big blue um, electrostatic potential map. Once we do the entire complex, not only is the blue gone, but the oxygen here is actually very nicely red. Here's our original, here's the green and the blue. Get rid of that. We have a nice red oxygen. Water is just amazing at stabilizing these hydronium ions. And that's why they exist at such high concentrations. 10 to the minus 7 molar, that's pretty high. Any questions? All right. <clears throat> we saw last week that polar covalent bonds can exist whenever you have differences in electronegativity. The compound we looked at was hydrogen fluoride. The hydrogen in, rich blue, the fluorine, the most electronegative element is red very, very strong potential. Well, if we take hydrogen fluoride and we put it in water, we're going to hydrogen bond just like we do to water itself. So here's our HF. We bring the water in. We get hydrogen bond with the negative end to our big blue area here and form a very strong hydrogen bond. And just like in the autoprotolysis, if either of these gets a slight bump, a slight bit of energy, this hydrogen bond is strong enough to literally break this covalent bond. And we wind up with hydronium and the fluoride anion. We have ionized the polar covalent bond. Now we can show this in an equation. HF reacting with water to give hydronium and fluoride anion. Now just like with water, we can not only go in the forward direction, but once we've ionized, we can go back to give us HF and water again. This reaction goes this way, and this way, and this way, and this way, 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 8th times per second. So it's a very, very fast reaction. We show this in chemistry using a special arrow. It's a double arrow um, going this way and this way. <clears throat> this is called an equilibrium. Whenever you have a reaction that can proceed in both directions simultaneously, very rapidly, that's an equilibrium. Now in general chemistry, you will study equilibria a lot. And it's a fun topic, 
It's a little too intense for intro kill. This again is the equilibrium dissociation of HF to give us hydronium and fluoride. We show it with the equilibrium because it's going forward and back simultaneously and very, very rapidly. Now, in this ionization, we have taken two neutral molecules and made ions. But most importantly, we have made hydronium. In chemistry, anything that ionizes in water and produces hydronium is referred to as an acid. Hydronium ion is synonymous <coughs> with acid. Now acids, we'll see, come in two flavors, strong acid and weak acids. They actually differ by what's called the equilibrium constant. The equilibrium constant describes exactly how much ionized product you have relative to unionized. The more hydronium, the stronger the acid. So at equilibrium, both of these are going, but the concentrations are not um, necessarily equal. If we have more of the ionized stuff than this, it's a strong acid. If we have more of this than we do hydronium, it's a weak acid. Now, acidity in chemistry is described two or three different ways. <clears throat> the uh, definition that we're going to work with is the Bronsted acid base theory. Bronsted acid base theory, very simply, tells us. Bronsted acid is a proton donor. A Bronsted base is a proton acceptor. That's an important concept. In this reaction, who donates the proton? It's HF. That's the Bronsted acid. When it donates the proton, who accepts it? Water. That's the Bronsted base. Now there's also the Lewis acid base theory that's somewhat different. Um, it has to do with electron donors and electron acceptors. And we'll see in just a bit, we could also describe this using conjugate acid base theory. So, This is a little animation to kind of describe what I just said about strong acids. Hydrogen monochloride, HCl, is um, a gas, actually. We can dissolve it in water. When we do, we get hydronium and chloride anion. Now, HCl, called hydrochloric acid, it's a strong acid. So when it dissolves in water, it will essentially instantly convert to hydronium and chloride. So here it is swimming around. It encounters water molecules, and suddenly, virtually 99.999% ionizes to form hydronium and chloride. Now, let me just show, talk about the nomenclature. Um, oftentimes, H3O plus is simply abbreviated as H plus. Makes it simple. But, <clears throat> um, now in order for this to be an accurate description, however, remember because this is an equilibrium, it's going this way and this way, right? So for every billion of these that you have, you must have one on this side. That's what makes this a strong acid. Lots of these, very few of these. Weak acid, 
is just the office. Any questions? Well, in um, general chemistry and whatever, we are going to deal with three or four standard strong acids. We saw hydrochloric acid, HCl. Again, strong acid, lots of hydronium. Nitric acid. Um, we've used nitric acid in lab. Basically, it's nitrate. This is nitrate. And we take one of the oxygens and put a hydrogen on it. This hydrogen comes off easily and gives us the ions. Perchloric acid, we take perchlorate. That's this guy. One of the oxygens, we stick a hydrogen on. Again, it comes off to form perchlorate and hydronium. All of these are strong acids. And all of these liberate one mole of hydronium per mole of acid. There's a word for that. It's called monoprotic acid. Monoprotic one proton. Now, why am I talking about it as a proton? Remember the animation we saw when the hydrogen went from one molecule to the other? It went there with no electrons. There were no electrons transferred, just the hydrogen. What is a hydrogen if you take the electron away? It's a proton. So this is called proton transfer. These are monoprotic acids. Now everybody's favorite acid is sulfuric. With sulfuric we take sulfate, which is minus two, and because it's minus two we can put two hydrogens on it. We lose one of these in this reaction and we form hydrogen sulfate. We can lose the hydrogen from hydrogen sulfate to form sulfate. That means we have two protons per mole. It's a diprotic acid. There's one triprotic that we work with, and that's phosphate. Phosphate is a minus three. So we can put three hydrogens on, and again, they can come off one at a time. Try it. Any questions? All right, let's talk about the acid base theory in terms of conjugate acids and bases. Slightly different concept, still basically the same. If we take nitric acid, HNO3, in water, as we saw, it ionizes essentially completely to give nitrate and hydronium. When you're talking about a conjugate acid and a conjugate base, the conjugate acid is basically the Bronsted acid. It's the thing that's going to donate the proton. So in this reaction, nitric acid donates the proton, right? Now the Bronsted base here is water. We don't care about that, though. The term conjugate base is essentially the leftovers. After nitric acid donates its hydrogen, what's left? Well, that's nitrate. So in this reaction, the conjugate acid will lose a proton and it will form the conjugate base. This is our conjugate acid. It loses its proton and forms the conjugate base. Now, there are a couple ways to think about this. Um, <clears throat> you can look at it like this. 
conjugate acid donates the proton, the leftovers, or the conjugate base. You can also say conjugate acid will have one more proton, so the base has one less proton, and typically one more negative charge. Personally, I think that thinking of it like this is probably easier. Any questions? Once again, the Bronsted acid here is nitric acid. The Bronsted base is water. But the conjugate base is nitrate. Let's look at a set. For these reactions, let's identify conjugate acid base pairs. So the way you do this, you look at your reaction, and you can ask yourself, what's the Bronsted acid? What is donating the proton? Well, that's HCl, isn't it? Once HCl donates its proton, what's left over? Chloride. So the conjugate acid base pair, HCl and chloride. Conjugate acid donates the proton, the leftover on the conjugate base. Let's look at the next one. Sulfuric acid can donate two protons. This is called the first dissociation. We lose one of the protons, so this is our bond state acid. After we lose that proton, what do we form? Hydrogen sulfate. This is the conjugate acid base pair. <coughs> Hydrogen sulfate, once we form it, can also donate its other hydrogen. So this again is a Bronsted acid, proton donor. Once it donates its proton, we form sulfate. Acid, conjugate base. Fairly simple concept, isn't it? Now, water is remarkable at stabilizing hydronium, but it turns out that liquid ammonia has many of the same properties. That's why you often hear it said that planets are far away that have oceans of liquid ammonia could support life according to reactions like this. So, in this <coughs> reaction, the rules are still going to be the same. Who is the Bronsted acid? Who's donating the proton? Nitric acid is. The Bronsted base would be ammonia. It's going to accept it, right? Once we have donated the hydrogen here, what do we form? The conjugate base. Conjugate acid, the conjugate base. Now let's think about this reaction backwards, because it is an equilibrium, right? It goes both directions. What I'd like you to think about, if we started on this side, what is the conjugate acid base pair? Who's going to donate the proton? And what's left over? That's right. This doesn't even have a proton. So there. No, this is the acid. It's going to donate the proton to the base. 
And what's left over is a moment. So think about these reactions one way and the other. On, a, on exam two, sometimes I will give you an equation and ask about the back reaction, not just the forward reaction. So make sure you understand the concept. Also make sure you understand it because the first tutorial for this chapter is conjugate acid base pairs. In this, we have half a reaction that's given. It's actually a very simple tutorial. The only thing you have to remember, look at what you have. This has a fluorine, this has H3O. So the fluorine part has to be in the first field. Okay. So what we're going to do is simply complete this equation. And you can't do super and sums, but as we look at this, F minus is a base, isn't it? It's the conjugate base of something. <clears throat> what loses the proton to form F minus? Quite simply, HF. What does HF give it to? To yield hydronium, quite simply, it's water. Let's do another one. Here we have ClO3 minus, and we have hydronium. <coughs> Our acid is obviously going to be. H3O plus. This is going to be the Bronsted base. When this picks up a proton, what do we get? HClO3. When hydronium loses its proton, what do we get? Water. Let's do one more. Now, both of these are potential Bronsted acids, aren't they? They both have a proton they can give up. So who's going to win here? What you have to do is think about the potential products. If this was the acid and this was the base, you would get H4O plus plus. That doesn't work. If this was the acid and this was the base, we would get water and sulfurous acid. That works. So this is going to be our acid. That's our Bronsted base. <clears throat> What's the conjugate acid of this stuff? Sulfurous acid. When it gains a proton, it's H2SO3. When hydronium loses its proton, we get H2O. Now the tutorial on <coughs> um, Blackboard is essentially the same as this. Again, you can't use super and subs, and you're going to identify pairs. Any questions? All right, well, chemistry is a very equal opportunity field here. If we have things called strong acids, it's only fair that we have strong bases. Strong bases basically are ionic compounds. Sodium hydroxide is a classic strong base. When you put it in water, it forms sodium cation and hydroxide anion. Just like strong acids, weak acids, the more hydroxide you form, the stronger the base. So this is essentially 100% ionization. 
Now, if we take a strong acid, H3O+, and we react it with a strong base, or we try this, what do we get? Strong base, strong acid. If we have equal molar quantities of both, we get water. Very acidic, very basic, mix them together, we're neutral. Strong acid, strong base, water. It's called neutralization. Let me show a simple animation. Here we have what's supposed to be hydronium and chloride in solution. So lots of things are left it, right? Lots of water. Here's the hydronium and chloride. This represents sodium hydroxide. If I take it and mix these together, what happens? The hydroxide and the hydronium will react. They will neutralize each other, and we will form two waters. We're left with sodium and chloride. Here's our equation. HCl plus NaOH in solution gives sodium chloride and water. When we do a neutralization like this, Simple way to think about it. Strong acid reacting with a strong base yields what? A salt and water. This is a neutral solution, very acidic, very basic. Any questions? So far, this isn't so bad, is it? Colorful. All right, here's a test question. <clears throat> Which of the following pairs lists the acid first, followed by its conjugate base? So what do we remember here? An acid will lose its proton. The leftovers are the conjugate base. So if H plus loses a proton, what do we get? Well, I don't know, but it's certainly not HCl. If ammonia, NH3, loses a proton, what do you get? NH2, right? You don't get NH4. Hydrogen phosphate loses a proton. You don't you get phosphate, not dihydrogen phosphate. That's gaining the proton. Hydrogen carbonate loses its proton. What does it form? Carbonate. And the last one, of course, acetic acid. The main say of general chemistry. If it lost its proton, it would form acetate anion, not a protonated acetic acid. Now these types of questions just have way too many words. But they're not hard. Here's our reference equation. Something is an acid and something is its conjugate base. Again, the thing to remember, to write on your little card for exam two if you want. The acid will lose a proton to form the conjugate base. So, this is an acid, yes it is, hydrogen carbonate. If we lose the hydrogen, we get carbonate 
not water. Again, it's an acid. If we lose the proton, we get carbonate. So that's right. And let's look at the others. Hydronium is, in fact, an acid. But if we lose the proton, we get water. Water is an acid. If we lose a proton, it's hydroxide. And finally, hydronium and carbonate, no, they're not a pair. Lose the proton, what's left over is the base. Just to drive home <laughs> this concept, if we have hydrogen sulfate, what is its conjugate acid? Again, whatever it was, it lost a proton to get this. To get the acid form, you just put the proton back. What do we get? Sulfuric acid. All right, any questions? Well, let's talk about neutrality. Now, this is in Switzerland. <clears throat> we have said that water can undergo autoprotolysis. And so it will form a small amount of hydronium and hydroxide whenever you have pure water. How much? If it is absolutely neutral, pure water. We said that the concentration of hydronium and hydroxide must be the same, and they're both 1 times 10 to the minus 7 mole. When we're talking about solutions that are acidic or basic, we're going to be talking about very, very small numbers. 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 6, whatever. In order to make this simpler for at least the last generation, chemists developed the concept of pH. pH is simply the negative logarithm of hydrogen ion concentration. This represents the log of hydronium ion concentration. When you see something shown in brackets like this, that represents concentration. The P is shorthand for the negative logarithm of the concentration. This is a very important equation. pH is the negative log of hydronium. Now, what is a logarithm? They were supposed to teach you that in fifth grade, but they didn't. OK? I don't think. They did think. But logarithm in the base 10 is simply the exponent the power that you must raise 10 to to get the number you're interested in. Just an exponent. For example, if we had 10 times 10, that's 10 squared, isn't it? What's the logarithm of 100? It's 2. Simply the exponent. 10 times 10 times 10, 10 to the third. It's 1,000. What's the log of 1,000? It's 3. Now, those are simple ones, right? What if I said, what is 316? What's the logarithm of 316? Well, it's simply going to be the actual logarithm is 2.5, 10 to the 
is 316. Now, take your calculator. Enter 316. Find the law button on your calculator. Push the button. Hit equal. You should get 2.5. This guy. Take your calculator. Find 10 to the x, however you have to get there. Enter 2.5. Hit 10 to the x and an equal. You should get 316. Those are the two calculations we're going to be doing today. Taking logarithm and doing 10 to the x. Any questions? All right. What is the pH scale? Once again, when we have something in um, brackets, it's concentration. Sometimes you will do hydronium written this way. Sometimes it's simply log of H plus. Okay, just short. <clears throat> the term pH is the negative log of hydronium ion concentration. In neutral water, What's the hydronium ion concentration? Well, we've said this. It's always 10 to the minus 7. Right? Now, what's the log of 10 to the minus 7? Just the epsilon, right? Minus 7. But if we multiply it by a minus 1, the negative log is 7. What's the pH of pure water? Seven. That's where that comes from. pH seven simply means we have 10 to the minus seven molar hydronium. Now, if we have more hydronium, the log is going to be smaller than seven. So if the pH is less than 7, if it's 5, that's acidic. If it's a basic solution, hydronium is less than 10 to the minus 7, and the pH is higher. Big number, basic, small number, acid, 7, neutral. Now again, being equal opportunity, if we have pH, we also have to have pOH. Only makes sense, but they're defined exactly the same. pOH is simply the negative log of hydroxide. Now, in neutral water, the pH is 7, right? Because hydronium was 7. 10 to the minus 7. In neutral water, hydroxide is also 10 to the minus 7. Now, just interestingly, if we multiply these two together, what do we get? 10 to the minus 14. As a general fact, Hydrox, hydronium multiplied by hydroxide at, under any conditions at 25 degrees centigrade is equal to 10 to the minus 14. Hydronium times hydroxide is 10 to the minus 14. If we take the negative log here, we get pH, right? 
Megan Wolf, here we get POH. What's the exponent here? Multiplied by minus 1 is 14. pH plus POH under all conditions is 14. These are two things that are worth remembering. Hydronium times hydroxide is 10 to the minus 14. pH plus POH is 14. That's for writing on your little card. Let's take a look at why this is important. We know that hydronium times hydroxide is 10 to the minus 14. If we know either of these calculations, since this is a constant, you can calculate the other. So if I told you hydroxide was 5 times 10 to the minus 8, and I said for your entire grade here, what is hydronium? You say no problem. This is hydroxide, this is hydronium, I'm sorry, this is the constant, 10 to the minus 14. Hydronium, 2 times 10 to the minus 7. And we're looking for this, this is a constant, divide this by hydroxide, we get hydronium. Just to show, if you take the two multiplied together, you do get 10 to the minus 14. All right, let's talk about the pH scale itself, just in general terms. pH scale typically um, starts at 0, goes to 14. It actually goes way down. A pH can be a negative number, minus 8 for sulfuric acid, and it can be much higher for a very strong base. Okay, but this is typical. This is neutrality, that's 7. Blood, sweat, and tears is a little bit above 7, maybe 7.3. Seven, Leach, ammonia, 12, 13, 14, whatever. Bad coffee, tomatoes, wine, Bad wine. Stomach acid, pH 2. It's amazing the stomach doesn't just dissolve itself, isn't it? This is a very strong acid. One molar HCl would be zero. This is your typical pH scale. Low numbers, strong acids, high numbers, bases. How do you measure it? Well, in lab, you do, can do it a couple ways. This is called a pH meter. It's basically a millivolt meter with a display. And you have an electrode. You take this electrode, stick it in your solution. It, this ends in a very thin glass membrane. Looks something like this. Um, and the acid will set up a potential across this thin glass membrane, and you'll measure the voltage. So that's what happens. Um, in intro kiln, you certainly will never use one of these. They're anywhere from two hundred to maybe a thousand dollars each. And as you're putting it in your little beaker, it's so easy just to tap the bottom very thin membrane, thick as a hair, literally. It smacks shatters. In our research lab at UIC, um, we used electrodes like this that were about $1,200 each. And we would probably break three or four of them every week. <laughs> now, whenever you get a new graduate student, you can count on, oh, maybe 10 electrodes because you know, we measure pH all the time and stick it in and throw it away, get a new one. All right.
So what do you use in lab instead? pH paper. Now pH paper is an engineering miracle. This is just a strip of paper and it has dyes in it. These indicator dyes will react with the acid or base in your solution and this will turn colors. You simply match up your color and you can tell the pH. Indicator solutions. Here are some. As you change the pH from 0 to 14, these guys undergo ionization reactions usually, and they change color. The one that we used in lab was phenethylene. This is the organic structure. This is a model of it. This loses one of these hydrogens. When it does, it changes from colorescent acid to pink in base. Phenothalin, very common, simple indicator. Somebody managed to figure out how to mix these guys together to make pH paper. An engineering feat, right? But, turns out that red cabbage beat us to it. If you take red cabbage juice and you make it acidic, it will turn into a lovely shade of red. Oops. It will turn into a lovely shade of red. If it's neutral, it'll be purplish. If it's slightly basic, it'll be lovely blue. And when you make it really basic, it turns hard green. Cabbage juice, the first natural indicator. Kind of cute. That's important to know if you cook. Okay? If you take cabbage and you chop it up, throw it in your pan, saute it, a little bit of butter, so it's neutral. It turns out this nice purple color. Red cabbage. If, however, you want to make a statement, you can take your sautéed cabbage and add a little bit of vinegar. Makes it acidic. And your cabbage looks like that. Now, today is Halloween. If you were making chopped cabbage, what would you do? Add a little bit of baking soda and get disgusting cabbage. It all tastes the same. It's just that this is truly disgusting. <laughs> all right, indicators. In lab, we use phenethylene as an indicator to tell when a solution went from acidic to basic. This is the heart of yet another general chemistry feature, and that's called a titration. In a titration, you're going to do this quantitatively. You use something called a burette. Burette is marked off in milliliters. It has a little stopcock you can turn, letting little drops of stuff into a beaker. Now, in the beaker, if this has base in it, this would be acid with indicator. So, you start off with this at some level. You look at it and you read it just like a graduated cylinder. Write this down. You then open the stopcock very carefully and slowly. Let the stuff dribble down until you get the color change. You now read the volume where we have the color change. Subtract these two, and that gives you a volume that you added. The base here was a known, so you know its concentration. Concentration times volume gives us the number of moles that we just added. 
And that tells you the number of moles of acid in your unknown. It's a titration. Again, a staple in lab in general chemistry. Now, the one that we attempted to do way back in lab seven that didn't quite work, we had our 24 roll plate. We put nitric acid in one, sulfuric acid in the other, phosphoric acid in the third. Now we realize that this is a monoprotic, a diprotic, and a triprotic acid, right? We added a drop of phenethalin to each, if we remember. Then we took base, added it dropwise until we had a color change. So for nitric acid, you're supposed to drop your stuff in, and you've got a color change. For sulfuric acid, diprotic, that's our first proton off, and there's our second. So phosphoric acid, triprotic, there goes the first proton, there goes the second, and there goes the third. So that's what was supposed to happen in lab seven. But because of scheduling, we had no clue what monoprotic, diprotic, and triprotic were, right? Sadly. But this is what it was. All right, let's say we take a solution. We are being brave here and taking our pH measures using the electrode. We stick it in, we get pH 7.23. I look at you and I say, what is the hydronium ion concentration? Well, we remember pH is simply the negative log of hydronium, isn't it? Let's fiddle with this equation. First thing I want to do is get rid of this negative sign. It bothers me. So let's multiply both sides by minus 1. So we get minus pH over here. OK, that's simple. Next, we're going to take what's called an anti-log. Now, if you have log of H3O, this is a number, the anti-log is just the number. If we have minus pH here, that's a number too. That's 10 to the x. So if we take the anti-log of this equation, 10 to the minus pH, and hydronium. Substitute to get our hydronium if our pH is 7.23, 10 to the minus 7.23 will give us hydronium. So if you have your calculator, here's mine, not as fancy as yours. What I'm going to do is type in minus 7.23, that's this. Then I'm going to hit 10 to the x. My calculator, I have to hit the green button first, then this one. And that's the number I get by George. This is hydronium ion concentration. A candidate to write either on your card or the back of your hand. This equation is central. 10 to the minus pH is hydronium. Simply type in minus pH here. 
do your calculations, and you get hydronium ion concentration. Well, that was simple. Let's do it for these. If I tell you that the pH is 4, what is hydronium? Well, remember our equation. It's 10 to the minus pH, right? If our pH is 4, 10 to the minus pH is 10 to the minus 4. That's hydronium. We can do that one in your head. Same thing with 10 to the uh, or pH of 12. That's going to be 10 to the minus 12, isn't it? Hydronium is simply 1 times 10 to the minus 12 volt. Now the inner uh, a little more difficult, you want your calculator. Back in the old days, we would take these and look them up in log tables. Back of every chemistry book, maybe half an inch thick, series of tables where you could look up numbers and your logs. Don't do that anymore. We simply say 5.5, that's going to be 10 to the minus 5.5. We do our calculation. 10 to the minus 5.5 should be 3.2 times 10 to the minus 6. 1.32. That's simply 10 to the minus 1.32. Do it on your calculator. You should get 4.8 times 10 to the minus 2. Now, again, in the research lab, we had extremely expensive pH meters and expensive probes. We could read numbers like this. Wow. But, same thing, this is simply going to be 10 to the 7.025. Type it in the calculator, hit the button, and that's our hydronium ion concentration. Okay, we could do that. Let's do one quick thought process. We have a list of pH values, don't we? Which of these are acidic solutions? Do you remember the rule? Seven is neutral. What's acidic? Anything less than seven. These guys are all acidic. All right, so we just took a pH value and determined hydronium, right? Let's do it backwards. What if I tell you hydronium is this? What's the pH? Just remember, pH is going to be the negative log of hydronium. Right? So if we simply type in the hydronium ion concentration on our calculator, like this, hit log, change our sign, we will get pH. That's even simpler than the form, isn't it? Take the negative log of both sides, is the fancy way to say it. Take the log, change the sign, is what you really do. So, back to my calculator. This is our hydronium. I type it in. 
I find the load button. I simply push it. This is negative. Multiply it by minus one. That's change of sign. This is our pH. Yeah? Does it matter how many significant figures? It does. Um, but I'm not going to explain that to you. <laughs> because, <laughs> because you would be the only people in the entire school here that would understand that. Okay, I would. <laughs> when you do significant figures on a pH, the first digit, that's the mantissum. Or, yeah. Um, does it count? Because that's just a power of 10. All the significant figures are here. That's four. We have four up here. So everybody does it wrong, but that's the way you're supposed to do it. We're, we're not going to do it that way. Again, this is the second equation you can write on the back of your hand. pH, negative log, isolated. And let's do our set. This is hydronium. What's the pH? Well, the first one is very simple, isn't it? Simply the exponent. That's good. Our next one, we would take the log of 5 times 10 to the minus 4. This should be 3.3. Take the log of 1.371 times 10 to the minus 8. Change the sign. 7.86. 7 times 10 to the minus 7. Simply type it in. Take its log. Change the sign, that's the pH. But before I push the button here, is this a neutral solution, acidic, or basic? It's neutral. Hmm? I gave this on an exam once. It was one of the easy questions that everybody got wrong, right? Because there's so many sevens here, there. everybody said neutral. No! No, this is 7 times 10 to the minus 7. The negative log of that is 6.15. So there's, it's not 7, <coughs> it's not 1 times 10 to the minus 7, it's 7 times 10 to the minus 7. All right, the last one here, simply type it in. Hit log, change the sign, and we get 4.33. Now there are two pH tutorials. I lovingly call them pH 1 and pH 2. pH 1, simple little word problem. Not that simple, but simple enough. We're looking for the pH. We know hydroxide ion concentration. Well, in order to get the pH, what do we need to know? Hydronium ion concentration, right? But we know that hydronium times hydroxide is going to be 10 to the minus 14. We are given hydroxide. Simply divide the constant here by hydroxide. We get hydronium. Once we have hydronium, take its negative log pH. So, 
10 to the minus 14 divided by hydroxide. That's hydronium. This is the other equation we're going to use. Negative log of hydronium gives us pH. Substitute in here. This was given. That's our constant. This is hydronium. Take its log, change the sign, pH 3.79. Here we're given hydronium. What's the pOH? Same process. We know that if we have hydronium, 10 to the minus 14 divided by hydronium gives us hydroxide. Once we have hydroxide, take its negative log pOH. Constant divided by hydronium, negative log hydrox, and pOH. Here's our numbers. This was given. That's the constant. This is hydroxide. Take its log, change the sign, 11.46. That is pH1. On blackboard, is very simple. Any questions? This is pH 2. It's a table, but it's not a totally trivial table. We are going to be given one of these guys. Okay? And you fill in the rest. Here we're given the pH. Well, if we want hydronium, what do we do? 10 to the minus pH. Ten to the minus pH gives us hydronium. We're also given pH here. We need a value for pOH. What do we remember? 14 minus pH is pOH. Simply subtract. 3.17. This one, 10 to the minus pH, 10 to the minus 10.8, 1.48. To get hydroxide, we could do the same trick here with pOH, 10 to the minus pOH, and that's our number. Let's do one more. Here I'm given hydronium. If we have hydronium, we know how to get hydroxide, don't we? Divide 10 to the minus 14 by that. If we have hydronium and we take its log, change the sign, we get pH. If we have hydroxide, take its log, change the sign, the average. Or we could do the 14 trick. <clears throat> 10 to the minus 14 divided by hydronium. That's the numbers. That's hydroxide. pH minus log of this guy, pH 2.91. POH minus log of this guy, 11.09. Well, that's simple, right? It is simple, sort of. Blackboard, not quite as simple. You see, on Blackboard, each of these would be calculated numeric. That means that I can say, well, if it's 8.13 and you put 8.14, that's close enough. But you can only do one unknown at a time. It won't let you do three or four. So instead, this is what blackboards are going to look like. You are given a list. 
pH, hydronium, BOH, hydroxide. One of these is wrong. What you have to do is identify which one is wrong and type in the right value. Okay. How do we do that? Well, remember, pH plus pOH is always 14, isn't it? Step one is the sum 14. If it is, both of those are correct. If it's not, one of them is wrong. 